This book, uh, Cut the Strings, I've just been uh, scanning it because I, I'm seeing it for the first time myself. Um, it's a story of uh, a young woman by the name of Amy and her, uh, uh, what's the word, Amy? Uh, remark <laughs> remarkable, uh, 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 maybe not so unusual in that a lot of kids have gone sure. the way you went, but it's certainly a gripping and in many ways a tragic story, is it not? Yeah, yeah, it really is. Um, but you know, it's also uh, really a story of the power of God to change a life too, yes. which is, you know, the whole purpose of the book. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now Sharon, you're the mom, and it seems that um, moms, maybe more than anyone else in a family, bear the <laughs> the day-to-day -day cost and burden of a child gone bad. Mm -hmm. uh, when did this all begin? It's hard to say. It, I think it began around the time she was in youth group. Um, what, at church? Yeah, at church. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, things happen. Um, friendships aren't always made and always don't stay. And I think her heart was already kind of wandering a bit then. We didn't really notice a whole lot of things because she was a very compliant child and did and said the right things and still went to church. But little by little, we just noticed things happening that when you add them all up, made sense that she was wandering from the Lord, but it didn't seem all obvious at the time. And I think we were a bit naive. I was a bit naive as a Christian mother. Um, had not had a lot of background in alcohol or drugs or any of that kind of thing. So when we noticed a, a little green leaf on her keychain, I inquired about it, but had no idea what it was. It was one of her friends that said, oh, a cool marijuana leaf on your keychain there. I didn't know that, sad to my shame. So we asked her if she was doing drugs. She said, no, I'm not doing drugs. So we took her word for it. I guess in our family, we, we believed what our kids told us as the truth until it was proven otherwise. So Amy, when did you start experimenting with drugs and, and why? I think, um, I don't know the exact age, of course, uh, but it was a few years after high school. And you know, I was raised in a Christian home, I'm in a great Christian home. But I never really made that commitment to Christ myself personally. And I just sort of observed everything from the outside. Um, and without that commitment, we, you know, without anything to anchor my life, uh, I started caring more about what other people thought of me than what I thought of myself. And, uh, and so then I started getting into, you know, drinking and, and, and uh, doing drugs and that sort of thing. Um, I think I was probably about 16, I think, probably. This, this was basically uh, peer pressure or just wanting to belong? Well, I think it's just wanting, yeah, wanting to belong. For some reason, I never felt like I was good enough. Like, I never felt like just me was good enough. I always felt like I needed to be um, stronger or smarter or prettier um, just to fit in. Which, which now, as I can see, is just a lie of the enemy. Just, just trying to make me feel like I'm not enough. But you know what? God created me as enough. Hmm. I am enough just on my own. <laughs> so so uh, describe for me uh, what happened. And I apologize again, I didn't have a chance to read your book. Uh, I just saw it for yeah. the first time this morning. So I'm interviewing blind here, but maybe yeah, that's no. okay. What, what d describe to me the, the, uh, the downward spiral. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think, like I said, once I did get involved in, in um, drinking and, and, um, and drugs, uh, I didn't want to stay at home anymore. You know, I felt, I felt the conviction at home, I didn't want to be there. So I moved out. Um, and got a little apartment downtown and everything seemed to get more intensified with the, the drug use. And uh, while I was living that life, I became pregnant. And um, I did listen to all the lies in my head and I did have an abortion. Um, and it, uh, it really, it was the, the worst experience of my life. And it left me just a hollow, pain-filled, broken woman. And after that, depression really took hold of me, and, and that's when I started, you know, using drugs daily, uh, cocaine, ecstasy, anything I could get. I was drinking every night, getting drunk, and um, that that's that was pretty much the. And how were you supporting this point. habit? Because drugs and, and alcohol cost a lot of money. How, how are you do. supporting it? They do. Um, pretty much any paycheck I would get would go to that. I ended up being about four months behind on my rent, um, and. Uh, you know, and I would look for uh, for people around me that could help me support it. I would look for boyfriends who had that sort of thing. 
you know, because that's that became all that really mattered to now, me. Now, while this is going on, Sharon, were you aware of, of her of her condition and and her financial stresses and all of those things? Not entirely. We lived, as we discovered later, in two separate realities. My reality is what I saw, and I didn't see this life so much, except when uh, Bill and I went to her apartment one time. We walked into the kitchen, and there were literally. Uh, liquor bottles piled almost to the ceiling and even at that point I looked at them and I, I thought there's no way my my daughter could be drinking it must be her friends dropping in and in my mind I knew she was an alcoholic but I could not say that word because I kind of thought if I didn't say it it wasn't true mm -hmm. in some way I was in denial because this was such a shock to me the drugs I really didn't know about entirely although that kind of goes along with that lifestyle did you know about the abortion not till later mm -hmm. now uh, because you've had the you had the abortion, yeah. I, I yeah. want to ask you some very specific questions yes. about it. First of all, why did you have the abortion? At that time, like I said, I was listening to the lies in my head, and those lies said things like, "You can't have a child. You're a drug addict. You'll be condemning this child to horrible things. You know, it's it's in the child's best interest not not to be born like that." And now I'm saying this, but these are all lies, of course. Yeah. This yeah. is not, you know, this is just what was going on in my head. Um, and, you know, I didn't share that with anybody. Nobody knew. Um, okay, now let me jump yeah, in there. Yeah, sure, of course. Th this, is, this, is, this is so often the case. You were alone. Yeah, very. You, you had no real support base there. Correct. The, the father of the child, he wasn't there to support you. Correct, yeah. Uh, so you're scared, you're young, uh, you're, you're vulnerable, and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. these lies, as you say, uh, had a huge influence. Yes. Uh, the, 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 the abortion process itself, mm -hmm. was, was it... Um, uh, was it difficult to get the uh, the process kicked into gear or were they more than willing to help you? Unfortunately more than willing. Yeah. It's a very very, um, well, I'll use the word easy, I guess it's a very easy thing uh, to, to, to do. How did you feel after the procedure was done and you were, in, uh, you were recovering? Oh you can't even describe it in words. Um, do you have a sense of loss to this day? Oh absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. If I could change that I would. Absolutely, yes. It, it is an agonizing experience. I'm not sure how else to put that into words. Yeah. 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 So uh, your, your counsel to uh, some young girl who's watching mm -hmm. you right now who's considering an abortion would be what? Oh, please do not. Do not do that. Mm -hmm. You will regret it forever. And it's so hard to see right now how things might be in the future. And, and as people, we tend to see the worst case scenarios in the future. But we can't see the future. We don't know what's coming, you know? And, and it, you, it will take a piece of your soul. You know, years ago when I used to do uh, open line television, uh, <clears throat> once a year I would do a show on abortion and I would ask f just for girls who'd had abortions to, to give me a call. And exactly what you're saying is what they said. Many of them would say, you know, I named him. His name was Tommy. He would have been 15 yeah. today, you know. Yeah. I think, oh my goodness, to to live with that day in and day out, it's got to be an agony. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet you have moved on. Mm -hmm. um, if I can just interject yeah. one little thing, that's because of Christ. That's because of Jesus. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, which which uh, I moving on. Uh, which I find interesting because uh, again, uh, how can belief in Jesus, who lived and mm -hmm. died and rose again 2,000 years mm -hmm. ago, impact your life today? How does that work? That guilt and that shame that just eats you alive after something like that, you know, that, that Christ came to take that sin away. That's why he came. That, that's, that's why he came. That's why he died on the cross. And for me to be able to leave that guilt and that shame and that filth at the foot of the cross and accept forgiveness for it, it's just unbelievable. It's a whole new life. It's and when, when life. Jesus forgives, uh, does he somehow enable you to forgive yourself? Mm -hmm. Yes, he did. That process did take a while. Yeah. It, well, it, that process was not a, all of a sudden process. It, right. uh, it, it did take a while. But yes, he enables you. He gives you that strength. Yes. So uh, back to you for a minute, Sharon. Uh, were you panicking? Uh, were you having sleepless nights, or, or, or oh, yes. you know, how how are you as the mom coping with all of this? 